So Astrid, thank you for sharing this, this great paper. Um, you've been working for a long time on um, haunting and, and microbial life in the ocean. And, and I think this paper is an important antidote to um, some of the thinking about uh, viral terrorism. And uh, you're, you're doing some important work to look at um, sort of the interplay of bios and geos and anthropos as agential beings, and then um, exploring the transformative agencies of uh, marine viruses or elemental ghosts. Um, and yeah, we'd love to just hear you situate this paper in the context of your broader work and um, yeah, hear, hear your latest thoughts since uh, penning, penning this draft. Okay, thank you, Evan. Thanks for the invitation and thank you all for, for being here and reading this um, paper with many, many loose ends still, even though it's forthcoming. It's forthcoming in a, um, in a book uh, called Reactor Activating Elements by Dimitri Papadopoulos, Maria Prishta, Bella Casa, and Natasha Myers. So the elemental part, the elemental theory, um, part is not optional in my paper, but at the same time, it is also a part of a, um, of a larger project. As Evan mentioned, I'm thinking a lot about haunted microbes, about how microbial life or how scientific engagement with microbial life in the face of climate change kind of reconceive some of our fundamental assumptions like assumptions about life and death. So this is a larger project of mine. This paper started as a 4S talk already four years ago uh, in Barcelona. And it's, that was at the time Elizabeth Provenelli's book on geontologies was coming out. And um, as you can see, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm uh, inspired by uh, Elizabeth Provenelli's engagement with the division of life and non-life. And um, I also have a, well, maybe related paper that uh, is trying to rethink biopolitics. And I think that was part of Elizabeth uh, Pominelli's um, agenda in geontologies, uh, claiming that uh, uh, yeah, biopower and biopolitics have to be resought in the face of the Anthropocene. Um, and that the Foucauldian figures that come with biopolitics are insufficient to explain agencies that, that happen within climate change. So I shared this, uh, this, this, um, this desire to rethink biopolitics uh, with, with uh, Elizabeth Provinelli, but her, I think, if I understand her correctly, her claim is that uh, biopower has been hiding the division between life and non-life that she thinks is, uh, yeah, is fundamental to, uh, to how power works. So um, geopower and geontology is not so much a corrective to biopolitics or biopower. It is more a way of highlighting the importance what the, what the division between life and non-life does. Um, so and uh, so I was uh, I really uh, I heard her speak in Oxford at some point and I was really intrigued by what she had to say uh, about um, yeah also about non-human agency to which I uh, get in a moment. Um, so but I was thinking uh, uh, as an I'm in science and technology studies for those of you who don't know me as an STS person. Um, I was, um, the first question that comes to my mind is what if we think about the biological or in this case, uh, the biochemical, um, uh, the yeah, biological and biogeochemical uh, in more scientific terms. So if we think about viruses, uh, if you bring in what's the latest thing that the scientists know about viruses into, um, yeah, Povinella's deconstructions of life between non-life. So what this paper is trying to do is trying to think, and yeah, there are many loose ends, to think uh, together with elemental theory, with, with Povinelli, um, of agents, new, new ways of figuring agencies with the help of marine viruses. And um, 
So just to tell you, marine viruses are not coronaviruses. They are, um, they are the, the viruses I'm talking about are phages. They are bacteriophages, they kill bacteria. And let me change my background for a minute so just to have a, a different background with phages in there. They can, it doesn't look that great, but uh, so these are, these are um, viruses in my background that are uh, attacking bacteria. So it gives you a, a idea of the scale too. So viruses are usually a lot smaller than bacteria, but scientists also have recently found large marine viruses that have are almost as big as bacteria. So let's go back to the, I like the other background better for some, just wanted to, to show you some phages here. So elemental ghosts, um, um, yeah, what I'm trying to think with elemental ghosts is agency um, beyond the organic, even though viruses are organic, but not necessarily organisms, um, and agency beyond the division between actuality and teleology. So the idea that agency and everything is becoming lively these days. Is there a way to think about an, an agency that is not necessarily, at least with this teleological part of being alive? And maybe I, I, I stop here now and maybe <laughs> I'll say a lot more uh, in response to, to questions. So just as situating the paper. Well, actually, that, that bit that you ended on was um, one of the places where I, I was hoping you'd go kind of deeper with Povinelli. So, you know, like you, I, I uh, got a lot out of geontologies when um, it arrived. Um, and But here's like a super nerdy, like on page 39 and, and, and geontologies. Um, I, I, I think, you know, there's, there's a, there is sort of a teleological assumption about, um, so she's on page 39 talking about metabolism. Um, uh, characterizing metabolism as something that consists of biochemical processes that emerge from and are directed towards creating and sustaining a certain kind of intentional substance that is goal directed at every and all level uh, and whose final end or goal is to sustain and reproduce a version of itself. And I, I think life is more like, you know, teleology, I, I just don't buy it, right? And, and I, I see this paper, you know, starting to gesture towards a vision of life that is non-teleological and would love to just hear you say, say more and, and kind of go, go deeper and, and push, push Povinelli. Because I, I, I don't think, um, I mean, I, I think she's naturalizing some, some of the like biology 101 def definitions of life. And I, I, don't, I don't think, um, I think we can go further. Um, I don't think she's trying to critique uh, or naturalizing. I think she is, she is delivering us what she think is a, is a uh, general understanding of, of life. And um, I think reproduction uh, as, as the goal of life is, is still uh, one of the, um, yeah, well, it's one of the central definitions of, of, uh, of, of the meaning of life, right? Um, so in, in, in this I, I, I guess, sense, I, guess uh, I read I it as like, so, so heteronormative, right? Like, so I'm, I'm thinking it with like Lee Edelman's No Future and I'm thinking it with, you know, Tim Dean's viral kinship and unlimited intimacy where reproductive futurity is um, kind of dismantled by these queer theorists of life. And, and I, just, I just found like, oh, Beth, you could, be, you could be so less heteronormative with this idea of life. But, you know, we're not just talking about Beth, we're talking about your paper. Um, but I, yeah, I would, I would just love to hear more. Um, yeah, I will definitely also try to pay more attention to um, to that part uh, in Povinelli, and I'm also, I mean, the, yeah, I'm invested in this, um, in this teleology uh, that, or in deconstructing the tele teleology, but not necessarily uh, in coming up with another definition of life, right? I'm, uh, so the, the goal is rather, um, I'm, I'm with Povinelli here and talking with viruses about the irrelevance of the distinction between life and non-life for agencies, right? So uh, for agencies and for, for the importance here in the, in the carbon cycle. Um, 
so so the, the idea was to come up with an uh, with a with an notion of agency in which teleology is not really relevant and also the distinction between life and non-life not really relevant so um it may work or not work <laughs> uh, um yeah cool well if if anyone is just joining us for the first time this week feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question or put it in the chat first um I've, I've got other questions that I could start shooting. Um, and, and maybe Astrid, if, if you could just tell us more, you know, you're, you're accounting for these geochemical carbon cycles. And this, is, this seems like a really important critical um, contribution of, of the paper, um, but it's not a Lovelock story. So, so maybe could you situate this? Because that, I guess, is also kind of a story of, of intention and teleology, like Lovelock. Um, how, how would you kind of situate your understanding of phages and, and um, oceanic microbes vis-a-vis -vis these more homeostatic accounts? Um, in relation to Gaia COE, um, well, maybe I should say what's, what is going on there. I mean, uh, as far as I know, scientists don't really know exactly how marine microbes are contributing to the uh, to the carbon cycle, but they do know that they're contributing a lot. And what is happening, and they have been, and this is why my interest in, in microbes in general, they have been neglected by scientists for a very long time. And when they all of a sudden um, discover their importance for the carbon cycle, it is within the context of climate change that microbes have been uh, receiving new importance. And so what viruses are doing in um, through the killing of bacteria in, in the ocean is basically modifying uh, the recycling time of carbon in the ocean. And there are two different kinds of processes and there are two different kinds of carbon. Um, so when, the, when they're killing bacteria, the, the material that, that remains is kind of, uh, they talk about dissolved organic carbon that can only be taken up if it can be taken up at all by us, by other bacteria. It doesn't, it's, it's a kind of a negative, it's a lack of carbon in the food chain. And carbon, when, if you think of a food chain as a chain rather than a cycle or a web, uh, in those images, the, the carbon goes directly back from, from small critters into bigger and bigger critters and then back into the atmosphere through humans <laughs> at, at the end. Um, so the, the activity of viruses is modifying uh, here the, the, the time of the recycling of the carbon in the ocean. So there's something that the scientists call the microbial loop in which uh, bacteria take up, up some of these dissolved organic carbon. And, but then there is a second mechanism in which uh, also through the activity of uh, microbes, carbon becomes this uh, inedible thing that is so small that even, and I don't think it's understood why that is, uh, that bacteria that is completely lost for the food chain. And that is a resource that, that scientists now think as an opportunity for carbon sequestration. So there's a resource of carbon in the ocean so that there's a, that's just swimming around there at, at specific layers. It doesn't go to the bottom and, and it's not taken up in the food chain, so it's just lingering somewhere in the ocean, but to such an incredible amount that it actually matters to our carbon budgets and the CO2 we have in the air. So that, um, well, I'm, I'm hesitant to say more because I don't think uh, um, people have been arguing in, in, in positive and negative di directions of the implication of that for carbon ch uh, climate change. But um, I think there is an opportunity and, and technoscientific people uh, see it as an opportunity for, as a mechanism for, to sequester carbon in the, in the ocean by just, uh, um, yeah another possibility for, for intervening. Uh, but to me, the interest is more the neglectance of uh, viruses and the, uh, the jumping on all, the, the, all of a sudden the importance of viruses because of, of, of climate change. So that agency, um, 
in the ocean that matter tremendously to us. But they, they also, I mean, viruses matter. I've, I've made some, some incredible claims in this paper about uh, without viruses, there wouldn't be any life on Earth. And the, the virologist or marine biologist really believes that because they are also uh, absolutely central for, uh, for evolution, right? So they are inserting their, their code, <laughs> their, their information, if you think of that, into other organisms. And that is one way in which uh, evolution happens. So they are, yeah. And we don't know if they are, um, well, and they're in the philosophy of science, there, there are disputes whether viruses are alive or not alive. And it depends really what you, how you think about life. And, but maybe um, I'll give you an opportunity to ask another question at this point. <laughs> My my jumping. Sure, go ahead, Roberta. Yeah. Uh, and then hello, everybody, and thanks, Astrid. Sorry, I wanted just to go back uh, a minute to Eben's uh, comments on Povinelli. I had to reread that page that you quote, and actually, I think uh, that we don't really have to push Povinelli in the sense that she's pushing herself already because rereading that quote, uh, she's speaking about imaginaries. She's not saying that there is a distinction between the geological and the biological in that sense. She's just describing how the imaginations about these two paradigms are, uh, which are the, the imaginaries. And I think her work is exactly to deconstruct the, the, the difference or the, the borders between those two uh, different imaginaries, but maybe I got wrong your comment. So maybe if you can uh, qualify better what you meant. I can circle back, but let's let's get uh, Sev Sevki's question too. And I don't want to take the attention yeah. away from asking have, to put it on Popanelli. <laughs> I have directly question to what just um, Astrid uh, was talking about. I just surprised Astrid. It's nice paper. It's quite intriguing. Um, Although you're talking about the sim symbiopolitics, you are really not really engaging and mentioning about uh, viruses as symbionts in marine ecosystem as well. So they are symbionts in the all uh, living beings as is in their uh, in their microbiome. So I just surprised you didn't mention uh, this side of the viruses in your paper, which could somehow contribute your arguments? Um, I'm not sure that viruses are symbionts. Bacteria are uh, symbionts in, in our bodies. There is a virome within the human body too, and there are trillions of viruses within the human that are also necessary for human life. Um, one um, effort I'm trying to make here, um, so another heading under which this, this paper is written is, um, is deconstructing of anthrop anthropocentrism in the Anthropocene. So, um, and some of um, the, the work on uh, symbiosis around uh, human health is very much centered on the human. So I do mention, I do mention, um, but I'm well, talking about ma ma marine organisms as well, not just, I'm talking about the uh, marine organisms, microbiomes, all the organisms, microbiomes, not just humans. So you're talking about the microbiome of the ocean, for example. Um, but viruses are really microbiome. symbionts. They are not, uh, they, they are killing. <laughs> I'm, no, I'm talking no, no. about the viruses. Uh, no, actually, they are they are contributing somehow. Each organism survive. Um, I mean, um, as you call it the here, metabolisms, but or immune systems. By also as an ecosystem itself, in each organisms, there have quite important functions to somehow deal with the bacteria as well. I mean, there there there, there is some interesting discussions there about uh, viruses as symbionts. In other, I mean, in, in each organisms, not just human. In fact, um, Sasha Gorbalenya, our, our kind of re resident coronavirus expert, um, insists that the large majority of viruses are not pathological. Um, coronaviruses and every other taxon, and, and I, I'm, uh, that extends to phages, as far as I know. 
So, I so yeah, I, I guess there, there's one one sentence where um, you say not all virus are terrorists, um, but I, I think there's you know there's there's a way to kind of flip it even even further if 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 you want want to go down that path. Well, I think phages by definitions are killing. <laughs> uh, Actually, no, but no. So they, are, they are those viruses, they are defined as those viruses that are killing bacteria, right? So uh, I think, yeah, I wanted to, um, I wanted to emphasize here that the, the killing of bacteria, the killing of individuals is actually contributing on another scale to uh, diversifying life and the maintaining of life on a different scale, on a different scale, right? So, um, yeah, I, I think I, well, there, there's lots more you can talk about viruses and there are many, many, many other stories about viruses and appreciate viruses. Right. One one is evolutionary reasons, but also uh, clearly we do need viruses uh, in order to to maintain life on so many different levels. Um, I was intrigued by uh, by the idea that killing on one level uh, contributes to diversifying of uh, of life on another level. Um, so I. Yeah, <laughs> I could have written about other kinds of viruses, obviously, too. Um, but I also wanted, I made an effort to, um, to, this is, I'm not writing about symbiosis, even though I'm acknowledging symbio, symbiopolitics, a term co uh, coined by Stefan Hermike and taken up by many people. Um, and that is, uh, I'm also situating this book with, within this wonderful anthology by, uh, by Anna Singh and Alan Gann and Heather Swanson and Niels Bourbon on uh, the, the art, it's sitting here somewhere, the, the art of living on a damaged planet in which the book, as you may, some of you may know it, divided into monsters and ghosts and the monsters are those entities that are, um, engage in symbiosis, right? So half of the book is devoted to symbiosis, the other half is devoted to ghosts. And so I'm trying to relate uh, my paper to the ghost part in this anthology, but trying to do something slightly different with ghosts. Well, uh, in, in a sense that, um, yeah, haunting is becoming something not necessarily negative for us. So that haunting can be promising and pointing to a future that, that doesn't necessarily end in apocalypse. So that was an idea. Um, I don't know, I, I have a kind of- Go ahead, Cesar, yeah. So, okay, I, I find the paper really interesting. It stimulated in, me in many ways and the other I'm kind of confronted with some. So one of the things is, there seems to be like some things that I would call more anthropomorphism and some things that are more anthropocentric. And I find that difference is, is something that should be emphasized because sometimes you have uh, notions. Okay, so for me, it, anthropomorphism is unavoidable. You cannot basically make a, a theory about something as a human, not that it, isn't human in a way. And the I problem agree. is that when we go kind of anthropocentric, and for me that, well, I, I, I see your point that often that implies attributing to others or assuming that the mechanism should be analogous to human. Uh, but for me, it's more problematic when we kind of not see um, the similarities. So for instance, in this case, I, I or, in regards to Polinelli, I, I kind of go back to Karen Smith, uh, who was talking about, uh, about clays and the reproduction in clays and clays growth, uh, they have habitus. So it's not the same thing, but it has some, some issues in common, which I, I don't know if that's what you refer to theological. Um, I have to go back to Polinelli. In, in this case, what I find interesting is the, the contrast between grazers and viruses. And what I found very interesting is why is it difficult to perceive the smaller ones as predators? Um, and for me, it was more interesting to think about, about that ability to kill 
which you are pointing out, bacteria, viruses are, are killing, are doing a lot of the killing, but killing is not necessarily bad. It's part of, of maintaining a balance and a symbiosis. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering whether it's, it's more about enlarging the, the bios or to kind of acknowledge that antagonic side, which is not just growth, but you have to keep things in balance and whether that could be more productive than thinking um, life, not life. I, I, I get a bit lost in the life, not, not life. Because as you said, the, the difference between whether viruses are alive or not depends a lot on, on the context you take. Um, if, we take if we are taking out of, of, our, of our context, we are not alive either. And we can't, um, yeah, I don't know what, what you're... Um, I'm not sure if I understand. Uh, thank you, Sila. I'm not sure I understand all of your points. First of all, I, I completely agree with the, uh, with the important distinction between anthropomorphism and anthropocentrism. And I also think that anthropomorphism is unavoidable. And as I, the efforts are, um, maybe the, the, the translation of anthropocentrism for me is, is uh, taking away the, the human exceptionalism in the, in the sense of superiority, right? And I did um, think that uh, these characteristics that distinguish life from non-life in Povinelli are specifically human characteristic, or maybe most of most of uh, most of life in the animal kingdoms, but not necessarily microbial life, right? So not not all. Uh, microbes were not allowed to die until recently either. <laughs> so, uh, so, and not all uh, microbes have this progressive, uh, um, yeah, there, there is this idea of, uh, of, of, um, of on an evolutionary scale that blood life is complexifying continuously and microbes also intervene in that version. So there, there is something in this, when, when she's talking about uh, gross development and reproduction as markers of life, that does not hold for all microbes, right? But I'm not uh, f further engaging with, with that question, what would it look like? And that is something that I started thinking of when I, when I uh, began the paper and then turned into other directions. Um, what would it look like if you actually take seriously life cycles uh, of uh, microbial life cycles, microbial ways of, of life? Um, that, that would have been another approach to, to engage with that distinction. I do mention though um, the, the work by my colleagues, uh, uh, John Dupre and uh, or former colleague Maureen uh, O'Malley, um, who are uh, taking symbiosis seriously as um, um, as a way of life, and if you take, if you think of, if you naturalize the interactions between microbes and other beings, or if you uh, uh, think that as a norm, and if beings ha any kinds of beings depend on other beings for reproduction, then then viruses are necessarily, there's no reason not to consider viruses alive, they argue, because um, uh, they, well, as you, they need other host cells to, <clears throat> to reproduce, but if any life needs other beings to reproduce or just being alive, that is not so special. So there is an argument uh, in the context of symbiosis, if 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 um, if symbiosis are ubiquitous, then viruses should be alive too. But I didn't want to go that way, right? So I didn't I I I didn't want to make another argument for another division between life and and non-life. I I'm way more with Povinelli as saying that well, viruses don't necessarily um, for viruses it doesn't really matter. <laughs> um, but I wanted to, I want, I argue with her about the terrorism of viruses. Um, but I probably didn't quite get to your um, uh, question about the, the anthropomorphism there. So I'm, I'm not no, quite I, sure I understood your point correctly. I think I, I, I liked kind of also the, the way in which I was 
aiming to move and what I find interesting also made me think a lot about Robert Rosen and um, um, the anticipatory theory. But basically Rosen was also kind of working uh, in parallel with Margulis on, on symbiosis and chimeras and, and this kind of thought and basically thinking ecological relations as symbiosis. Um, and in that, that line of thought, um, then the, the predator and the prey are collaborating rather than, than um, competing as, as is usually seen. And from that perspective, you could reintegrate viruses uh, and their prey or vice versa. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, sorry. I I'm not Salah, sure, but... go, go ahead if you want to respond, but Sala also has a question. No, maybe we can continue. I'm not quite sure uh, where the question was at that. I, yeah. No, I, I don't have a response at the moment. So go ahead, Sala. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm, I'm really enjoying the conversation, and I think each and every question and comment opens the great paper to me more and more and I, I really want to read it for a second time and I look forward to uh, reading it with the other uh, chapters together in the volume. Um, and I, so I was left wondering, sort of following on the conversation about the, um, the way in which I really, really appreciate putting microbes at sort of the forefront, but as well as um, the, um, what did, how did you call it, dehumanizing the Anthropocene. I think that is it's, it's super interesting in the conversation about the Anthropocene and, and then what. Um, and because it, it sort of addresses to me the question of, well, disaster for whom, apocalypse for whom, like who's, which perspective um, are you prioritizing there as to where the life and whose life is matters in the end. And you quite not very well show that it's, it, um, that these viruses, which are often thought of as terrorists, um, are actually also really crucially important. Um, I feel like I also sometimes get a little bit lost in the semantics of um, is, is what the virus is. So in as much as, as much as I love the fact that the viruses are put so centrally there, I also feel like they're left a little bit alone to do the work um, of dealing with the human cause problem. So in some ways I was perhaps wanting to know what, how, what is the role of the humans in, in this carbon cycle process that where attempts are being made to um, reorganize the situation that neoliberalism and capitalism that you described at the beginning of kind of creating this problem. So I wondered um, what, what is the role of the humans in trying to reduce the problem of the uh, climate change in this, this marine biology context. So now the, it seems like the, you're putting, while putting the um, viruses to the center stage or microbes to the center stage, the, the human responsibility um, is, is left up out of the picture. And I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about what's sort of behind the, the work. Why I've left human responsibility out of the question. Of course, there is a human res responsibility, and uh, but there's also a human responsibility uh, to to take microbial agency into <laughs> account in, in, in a way, right? Um, to, um, well, it is not a, um, it, I'm not trying to make a suggestion how to overcome capitalism at this point yeah. or how to, um, that would be another paper <laughs> at <Okay>. least. <laughs> so, um, the, I well, I'm trying to to draw um, to the focus away from 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 the human and without without saying that the, I'm not trying to say there is no human responsibility, obviously, right? So there is a is an unprecedented speed of changing carbon uh, cycles, right? And uh, and of course, there's, this is is not. Uh, that can't keep going on. Um, sure, but there's also responsibility like for climate scientists to keep microbes into account. 
yeah and i don't deny that there's there's these very powerful papers making precisely that point in the past year or two and my question was not so much like why would you leave them out? But can you, um, as an in an analytical focus, to 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 keep them as some analytical separate units, where the that that symbiosis, where definition actually of the symbiosis is not that it's always a mutualistic relationship. There is a parasitic relationship. So I'm thinking of that. Is it what do we lose when you when we don't take the human microbial assemblage as the focal point, but just the virus? perhaps it was that that I was trying to get at. Oh, I see, I see now, yeah. Um, I, I do think that uh, even if, if you start out with I'm um, not so good doing here with a relational ontology, even if you start out, um, the human doesn't always need to be part of it. Even, even though I do agree with, with, with Caesar that we, we can't, uh, well, we are doing the describing. We uh, we can't really get um, beyond anthropomorphism uh, because we are humans. But I don't think we we have to necessarily describe the world always in relation to the human. I don't I don't think that's necessary. I think that there are relationalities that uh, can be described without always uh, relating them to humans. Is that what you meant, or? Yeah, I think we're getting at them. The, um, the complexity of, of of the definitions. I don't want to um, take time from other people's questions. I but, and that's all of that is background to say that I really like the paper, so I look forward to seeing it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Caitlin's also got a question. Hi. Yeah. Um, so thank you for this. Uh, it was really exciting for me also to see. Um, Vir uh, viruses and geology put together in this way and um, looking at these different scales. Um, I loved on, uh, I guess on mine, it's page six, an alternative imaginary that troubles the boundary between life and non-life must be able to accommodate new kinds of agencies that do not begin with an intentional unified subject. It was really, um, uh, I loved that, um, that part. And, um, and zooming out to look at um, these interactions. Um, I did, I admit that I didn't fully follow a lot of the um, intricacies of the carbon cycle um, at some points, um, uh, was a little bit confused. So my question is more, um, is a bit related uh, to that section where um, while, uh, you know, I, I'm fully, uh, with you about um, wanting to take or decenter the human in the question, um, especially around agency, I guess, um, at, you know, haunting the paper as a whole is the question of global warming and um, that that is a, you know, and a fundamentally anthropocentric or um, human derived event. And so I was wondering, um, a little bit more about uh, since the description to me was um, uh, of the carbon cycle was more around the agency that the uh, viruses and the role that they play in the um, kind of uh, current um, regulation of the marine system. I was wondering um, in that way around um, in this in figuring the disruption of um, global warming. Uh, if there's more, you know, information and more agency that the um, potentially that the viruses may or may not um, in any speculation around uh, that system regulation and what role they might play within it, um, either at a smaller scale um, of looking at specific species that may or may not be more affected by them or um, at the larger scale of the overall kind of regulation. So I was curious to, to know more about um, that kind of level of the agency of the viruses. So thank you. Thanks a lot for this question. Um, the, the last part, I just have to say, I don't, I don't know. I mean, this is a kind of a sign, if I understand your question correctly, it's a scientific question that I, I don't even know if the scientists know right now. One thing is, 
that I also read is um, it's where the agency is very local, and I find that fascinating too. So that that um, and of course that makes it very very difficult to make prediction for global climate uh, uh, global carbon cycles and. Um, those bacteriophages are usually um, have a speci specificity to specific bacteria. So they, they kill some bacteria and not other kinds, so some kind of species, even though species are very, very difficult with, with bacteria anyway, because there is gene transfer in all kinds of directions. So, um, but some of these viruses are generalist. And, and I think this is, uh, and so they, they can, they can attack more or infect more than, than one species. I think these kinds of things that the scientists are just, are just beginning to figure out themselves. Um, so I, I, but that itself, that there is a, both a, a locality, a specificity, and then a more gen, generality is kind of, uh, I find that fascinating about the complexity of the, of the agency at, at, at stake here. Um, with the ghostly part of the agency, I wanted to, um, that was also taking up from, from Paul Vinelli, I wanted to emphasize that the viruses don't have to be uh, present in, in the sense of being actualities. So I'm trying to get at a notion of actuality that is actual, but not necessarily present, right? So that is a, that is a, the temporal distinction between life and non-life, I have been so interested in, so that that is that um, actual and that entities have to have a presence in. But then, if you have presence, you can't be an agent anymore because you don't have desire. You don't want to go elsewhere. You don't. So, and I think that is the um, the part of the viral agency that I find so fascinating, and therefore also I'm not fully committed to say viruses are clearly processes. Well, there is also, they are also sometimes substance and sometimes uh, better described as process, but if you look at them as process, you already put them on the side of life. So there is a, um, I wanted to hold on to this, 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 uh, multi-dimensional uh, agency of viruses and yeah um, scientifically I don't I don't know what <laughs> what the scientists will be doing with with that in the next few years for for the climate cycle there's a question from Nicole um, okay um, yeah thank you so much um, Astrid this is really brilliant and made me feel like I should have paid more attention in um, high school biology class um, but nonetheless um, I had a question about where Derrida sort of pops up at the end and um, the term justice comes up and that just like really struck me because I don't think it was in the paper before that and um, you, you talk about hope but it was just I wanted to hear like a little more about justice and how you know the marine virus might be a figure of justice. I, I, I don't even know if that's somewhere you want to go or if it just like happened to be in that quotation that you're using for other reasons. But um, yeah, big, big question. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you for that, Nicole. It, it is a big question. And um, yeah, that is popping almost out of nowhere in the, in the in this paper but in the context of uh, in the context of, of the rest of my work I uh, I am engaging Derrida and ontology comes from Derrida and when, uh, all the notion of ontology comes from 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 Derrida and um, the the one of the points is uh, in relation to to what I just said about agency about uh, getting rid of agents uh, the the disruption between presence and or the binary between presence and agency, right? That, that's what I'm uh, that's what I'm trying to do with haunting. So um, ontology is in Derrida uh, a way to understand. Um, yeah, it is a. Um, it is an inheritance to, it's a way to connect uh, across times. And um, 
He, he is saying, as, I think the quote is in there, he is saying something that can be no justice in the present, right? And that can be, that is, a, is, a, is another way of saying that it can be no, um, if, you, if you seek, um, if you try to uh, circumscribe a totality that is ultimate injustice, whenever you want to hold on to something and, and give it um, specific delineated boundaries that is, um, that is an expression of uh, ultimate um, injustice. Um, I don't, I don't know if it makes sense. Um, so he, he thinks of justice as, um, as a promise, as and the promise has this spectrality to it, which is already here now, but can never be reached. But just never, because if uh, if a promise will be reached, it disappears as a promise. It's the nature of a promise. Once when you promise something, and it will be reached, and it's gone as a promise. So he thinks um, in justice in terms of this spectrality is a is a term. It's, it's temporally spectral, and um, so the hope in, in this story about these agencies that can't really be pinpointed to, to a present. I mean, I text the justice a little bit on and that is uh, as, is probably a bad move in the in this paper because it's it's uh, yeah, the relevance is a lot bigger than I could possibly go into in in at the end in the conclusion. Um, but it is, uh, I'm invested to in the temporality and the deconstruction of this opposition between presence and, and uh, uh, teleology as associating with agency and for Derrida that is also necessary for conception of justice. I don't know if I made any sense. But... Actually, yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> uh, Cesar has another question. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> okay, so um, one thing that I found interesting was viruses are very much aligned with the humoral theory of, of disease. So in that theory, the, the cause of the disease is, is not alive. Um, and so, and humoral theory is connected to the theory of, of the elements. So I find there is a lot of connection intrinsically between those elements. So one question is, uh, did you trace it? Are you elaborating from, from that? Um, was that something that you were doing aware? Um, and the other thing that kind of nags me a little bit is in those, in those um, kind of in humoral theory, not in the theory of the elements, kind of God is present as a, a source of causality. So I find that that bit, yeah, you are you we can we can talk about the viruses not being an agency uh, with an intention, um, but that displaces often the intentionality to another realm. So that part I find problematic. That's more a, a comment um, there. Mm. I'm not sure if I want to talk about uh, intentionality at all. <laughs> um, so I'm struggling, and there's um, there's no no definite answer. I'm struggling to think agency without intentionality. Um, so I'm yeah, I wouldn't want to uh, to supplate something and put intentionality to to another. We um, the elemental theory kind of helps me a little bit as a. Uh, in the sense of, um, if you think about air as making visibility possible rather than uh, as, as, as a specific kind of force, if you think about the, the, the Greek elements that are um, agents, but they're not things, right? So um, it is that kind of, I wanna, yeah, in relation to what you said about disease, um, I wouldn't want to. I want to get away from this idea that the virus is this thing that causes something because it's not a thing that can be pinpointed in a person that causes something. And when you, I mean, that also little, in a way, connects to the question about justice. Um, 
when you have a cause, you have a blame, right? In order to, in order to, to um, uh, if you have an origin, you, you can blame and then you have, you can gain closure and then you can, uh, um, so you, you, you can have causal agency with, I'm, I'm interested in, in the possibility of causal agency with, with, without origin where you can't say, oh, this is a thing, this is responsible now. And this is also, I'm thinking about this in, in terms of the, Current pandemic. If you if you think about the the cause uh, uh, and think about a origin of in one specific kind of other animal or in one specific kind of location, you have a blame, and then the discussion is over, right? <laughs> well, it's not over, but it's a uh, it's 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 a the desire for closure that is um, um, that needs. Uh, entities or units in order to to put blame for the onto something which would be injustice in Derrida, in Derrida, Deridian terms. So I don't think about of um, the cause of a disease as a as a uh, non living particle. <laughs> is, that, is that is what you were okay, asking? So, um, in, in the case of funeral theory, the idea was that people were getting sick because they were exposed to uh, hot or, or cold or um, kind of the, it was, so there, there wasn't uh, causal, the causality was there, but it wasn't implied as something that could be blamed. It was not something that was alive. And the mm -hmm. virus, so the, the venom uh, went as one of those examples. Uh, but but I, I get your point about and, and it's very interesting to think about, okay, how to switch the, the blame of and the consequences of intentionality as blame. That's, I find that, that very useful. I'll think about that more. Okay. So, so going back to something you said in the beginning, uh, Astrid, uh, and, and also that's, that's in the paper about um, the ways that these phages are taking life out of the world and, and um, you know, this, this is related to what Povinelli talks about. You know, she talks about uh, non-life breathing in and, you know, life breathing out as, on this kind of planetary scale. And, and I'm also thinking of the work of Debbie Bird Rose, who talks about double death and, you know, the, the kinds of, uh, you know, death usually is an intergenerational gift that, you know, gives uh, to the future, uh, you know, the, the the death of a whale fall, for example, or or a, a, a carcass in, in a, a terrestrial ecosystem, but here and and I think this is you know uh, something that I'm taking away from the paper where my thinking is has consequentially shifted. You know, you're showing us that taking uh, matter from life and rendering it into non-life is uh, at, a, at the current moment kind of crucial for planetary survival or futurity. Um, so, so I just wanted to point that out and, and you know, thank you for that and um, invite you to say more. But, but also I, I'm a little afraid of like the, the techno-scientific dream of mastery and control here. And it, it, it just seems to have gone so wrong in so many other domains. So uh, do, you, do you have any particular hope for that dream of you know, let's let's understand these phages and sequester carbon this way, or do you think it's like these other dreamings, like an easy techno fix and a fetish logic that is bound to fail? Okay, uh, thank, thanks for this, Evan. Um, two points about uh, uh, my hope uh, is lies in the uh, non ability to control viruses here. Uh, I think um, part of the, the, it's of course, there's always this, this immediate scientific imaginary of an easy techno fix, but I think uh, the, the whole, the complex, complexity and undecidability of, uh, that is, has not only to do that the scientists don't know yet enough, uh, but the inherent complexity and the hand indeterminacy of the of the behavior of the virus, um, I think, would uh, yeah invalidate uh, attempts of control. Um, 
So I, I just think that the virus is as smart as any human. So, and, and this is where my, and the, my, my hope is actually in the realization of that. Um, so uh, rather than the opposite, rather than uh, continuous attempt to control, but that doesn't mean that we have to try what's possible, right? So I'm also, I am also don't want to go all the way in the other direction. Um, I, I think I'm very much just on a hell way on both of this, and also on the on the idea of killing and um, um, and what you, what you said, double death. I'm absolutely invested to the importance of finitude, and but I don't think that that killing is always uh, to be avoided. I think. Uh, life doesn't happen without death or killing um so um yeah and i i i my, a lot of i'm getting a lot of hope out of uh the um yeah the indeterminacy and the complexity of the behavior of the virus thanks astrid and, and thanks everyone again for all the smart comments um this is a super generative paper can't wait to see the the final draft and it sounds like a really fabulous collection that it's a part of uh next week we have augustine fuentes he's a biological anthropologist talking about the importance of, of primate sociality something that we're kind of living without at least most of us in in these times um, I'll circle back to some of the issues of, of medical inequity that we talked about last week with Caitlin, um, sharing a bit of my book about new genetic medicines uh, the next week. Um, then Nicole uh, is, is going to share something. Uh, we've got some more um, scientists coming coming back. Uh, Jacob uh, Zinstag Klopfenstein, um, someone who's um, a super smart um, guy involved in One Health, but um, looking at coronavirus animal interactions. Um, there's a lot going on. We've, we've also got Jamie Lorimer, who's just booked in before Christmas. So, so um, see you all soon. Thank you, Astrid. And uh, yeah, again, thank thanks. you all for your for your great discussion and your generous comments. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Evan, can you hold on a minute for? Sure. Cool. <laughs> and thanks, Rachel.